So, good morning, Juliet. Good morning. Here in Utrecht, in the beautiful garden with some kids playing on the background. Yeah, uh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday you gave your keynote here at the Sharing Economy workshop uh, from the University of Utrecht mm -hmm. uh, about Sharing Economy, Hypercapitalism or a Sustainable Alternative. So, what do you think? Which is it? <laughs> <laughs> That's the big question everyone's asking. Um, I think if we look at what's going on now, we can see tendencies in both directions. So on some of these platforms, we're starting to see labor really being exploited. Um, uh, I think the labor services platforms are going in a, in a pretty uh, exploitative way. On the other hand, uh, with the recirculation of used goods, that, that has some uh, quite good environmental benefits. And I think the um, the asset sharing um, also has has some potential. Uh, Airbnb, which is you know a huge player in this space, uh, is doing some interesting things. But on the other hand, they're they're a great example of the two faces of the sharing economy. Consumers love it. The people who are earning money on the platform love it. On the other hand, the people who are trying to rent apartments in cities where Airbnb is really popular are finding uh, the rents are going up, apartment availability is going down, tax revenues are not necessarily being collected. So um, it's a mixed bag. So a, a story yesterday was also really clear. Uh, every story has two sides and that's also something that you explain right now. Um, and why? Because I also see, uh, like it, uh, uh, with the taxi market, it's a really yeah. classical example because you got the taxi markets, uh, they're really bad in, in communicating. Uh, you got the, the Uber, they're really smart in communicating. So, uh, like in the Netherlands, uh, uh, Nick from Uber, he's, uh, he was working for five years as a brand manager for Heineken. So, they're really hiring really smart marketing, branding people to share the story. And what way? Because this, uh, this is a complete different competition than we knew before. It, it's it's completely different. Uh, so, how do you think existing organizations or, or branches can 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 compete against this level of 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 uh, yeah this gap? Well, taxi I think is an example of an industry that has a very tough road uh, when it's confronted with something like an Uber or a Lyft uh, because it it is an industry that is very highly regulated and over time enormous rents developed in the taxi industry. Now why did that happen? You know, you, you, you Uber points to taxis and says, oh, these stupid outmoded regulations, etc. This is so inefficient and, you know, we're going to come in here and save you from all this economic inefficiency. But taxi regulations came in because of the nature of that service, which is that it's it's very easy to become a taxi driver. Anyone can get in a car and drive people around. Not anyone, but very, very uh, common skill. So taxi drivers, before the regulation, couldn't make a living. Many too many taxis came into the market. So the state stepped in and said, we need to do something to make this a a service where people can earn a livable wage, so they put on entry barriers. And then uh, they, didn't, they didn't expand the number of taxis over time enough, so you get these enormous rents. The rents are going to the taxi owners, not the taxi drivers. Uh, so it, it became a, uh, a pretty backward industry. But I think we shouldn't think of taxis as something which is, what's going on in the taxi industry is really different than most other industries because you had those extreme barriers to entry and uh, real uh, shortages on the supply side. Yeah, and also uh, uh, also the, 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 the big challenge that we have also, uh, what we saw yesterday, uh, Uber and Airbnb, they are the, the, the main examples that everybody uses for research because they're interesting because I, I understand because there's lots of data about or, or lots of th things to think about but don't you forget because I really believe that, that change doesn't come from, 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 from today or tomorrow. So the change is, is something that really is happening slowly. Uh, isn't there a, a, a danger that when we're focusing too much on these big examples that we're forgetting all the other more small niche examples that, that are really are making the change that we need? Absolutely. So in my project, uh, which has been uh, looking at the sharing economy for the last four years, we have seven cases. Uh, Airbnb is one of them, but most of our cases are small 
uh, smaller cases, we have uh, a number of nonprofit sharing examples. And I personally think these are very exciting because anyone knows how, in a sense, or I shouldn't say that, it, it's not that hard to make a market in which people are um, uh, rewarded for, I don't want to say being greedy, but for just you know going out and getting money. We, yep. we know capitalism knows yep. how to do that. But can we create new kinds of markets or new exchanges in which it's not about making money, but it's about, say, reducing carbon footprint or creating more social connection or giving people more meaning in their life or allowing them to be to be um, creative and uh, producers. We uh, heard yesterday at the conference about uh, new startups in the food space that help people to learn how to be chefs. I mean, these are great examples of the creation of an economy which is a much flatter economy than the one we have. You know, the Uber, Uber kind of examples, in the end it's about the VCs and the platform owners exploiting uh, a lot of poor taxi drivers, um, but when we're talking about things like uh, cooking, um, uh, uh, cooking platforms that allow lots of people to be chefs, not just the few who are good enough to be able to afford a restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, that's when things get really exciting. Or when we're talking about neighborhoods that come together and uh, share durable goods with each other, um, or time swaps where people uh, provide services for each other in return for services back. I mean, that's some really novel economic uh, innovation. Yeah, but when you look at building also a sustainable model for the future, uh, because I also see the, uh, the, the difference in the, in the really capital and, and the more uh, motivation and, and vision driven uh, 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 initiatives. But I also see that the uh, more uh, efficient-driven uh, initiatives are having m much trouble with building a sustainable model that they, that they also uh, are getting revenue and also that they're also uh, uh, making able that the platform will uh, last in the future uh, and that will stop when the subsidy stops. So, so, so what yeah, do you see happening over there? Yeah, that's the challenge. I mean, I like to think about that we need to move toward a hybrid model. So on the one hand, the, the new technology, the digital technologies, the platform software and all of that, that stuff is really fantastic. Uh, we want that to diffuse pretty widely to lots of different things. Uh, I think for the more economically innovative models like a time bank uh, or some of the things I've been talking about, um, those need to innovate to figure out more of a, you know, to use business language, a value proposition for consumers. I mean, Uber certainly got that, cheap, cheap car rides. Airbnb got that, cheap lodging. I mean, that's, that's of real value to people. So what is it, uh, what are the other uh, value propositions? What are the other things that could provide real value to people? One of the ones I'm most interested in is, um, not the kinds of exploitative labor platforms that you see in the sharing economy today, something like a task rabbit or a Postmates, which are just paying minimum wage and taking away worker protections. But what about platforms that are owned by the workers themselves? So platform cooperativism, we call it. Um, I think about home health care aides. I mean, that's a group of very low paid workers, many of whom work for agencies that take about you know, half of the money they earn. So they could start a platform. The ratings and reputational information that's crowdsourced on these platforms takes the place of an agency. Yeah, and because I really see also the, the, the second stage uh, or second generation platforms. Uh, but maybe it's an idea that we focus on communication because now we're focusing uh, uh, with media and communication uh, on the big examples and, and that they're good or they're, they're bad. But maybe we also uh, are, 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 are maybe have to focus more about their role because I really believe that, like the role of Uber is is like a bulldozer to, to pave the way and and when the way is paved because in, like in the Netherlands uh, there are many initiatives to try to change the taxi law but they couldn't now there's Uber with a valuation of 50 billion dollar so they got <laughs> interest and they got the, the power uh, to to change uh, the system and. Uh, what do you think about my idea that I really believe that 
the added value of this platform is, is to pave the way and when the way is paved for others, yeah, then also the more social cooperative, more, more decentralized platforms will, will, uh, will come. Well, maybe, but you know, the danger in that idea is that once these platforms get very big, they're very hard to dislodge. Consumers are locked into them. They get all those network externalities, we call them, because the big value is by having so many people on the platform, it means you can always get an Uber because so many drivers are there for Uber. If you go to a small platform and you have to wait a long time, that's not the service that people are looking for. And, and one of the things we know about the online environment so far is that platforms get really big and uh, they get some monopoly power. They get a lot of monopoly power and they're hard to dislodge because you can think about Facebook, you can think about Google, you can think about um, Amazon eBay, I mean, these are, they get big and they stay. Now people say, oh, it doesn't really happen. Look, MySpace got knocked off by Facebook, but MySpace never had the same reach that Facebook yeah. has. Yeah. So uh, it's true at the beginning, when you have multiple platforms, some of them are gonna die. The question of whether we will be able to do away with Uber, if it, you know, once it really scales, uh, that's that's going to be interesting and because the other thing to remember about uber uber is google and uber is goldman sachs uber is the biggest most powerful companies in the uh, united states economy and in some ways in the world i mean it's the number one uh, digital company and it's the number one financial behemoth and and a pretty uh, you know, if we're talking about Goldman Sachs, a pretty evil and predatory company at that. Uh, they won't go quietly. No, no I, I'm sure about <laughs> that. But in the end, but you also look at uh, the, the uh, I think also the advantages of being a global player uh, will be less because now, uh, like uh, a car sharing, uh, in the end, uh, we've got Snapcar and, and they get the ambition to, to be the, the biggest uh, car sharing platform in Europe. But in the end, I'm not going to, uh, to cycle more than uh, five minutes to get a car. And when you look at the added value of a platform, that is uh, insurance, but in the end, I, I really believe in five years uh, sh uh, there will be a, a, a sharing box in your insurance for your car. Uh, same like with holiday uh, 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 insurance, you get a, a winter sport or a global coverage uh, check. So then you pay uh, a couple of euro extra and then you ha have it. So then th th that is a added value of platform that will disappear. Uh, and also with new, more uh, 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 other reputation systems that are not binding the two platforms. Uh, there are many initiatives right now. So I think also the, at one side, the advantage of being a global player uh, 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 will go down, except uh, with, with platforms like Airbnb, because then you really go to another place. And the other side, depends on, uh, they really have to prove the added value, because m many things they are now adding uh, as a value will be commoditized uh, in the next few years. Absolutely. And I talked about that yesterday. I mean, what do the platforms offer? They offer Ratings and reputation, like you, I believe those are going to be delinked from the platforms. They offer insurance. Anyone can do that. They offer um, software, which is becoming mass produced. I mean, mo many of these platforms use the same software. And then, but, but, but the thing that they do offer is critical mass of users. And that's the hard thing. So if the, if alternative platforms can figure out how to scale and to get get the users and that's where I think um, the value proposition is important uh, so what is it that the platform is offering to people uh, if it gets the right mix of things uh, I think they can succeed okay so let's uh, hope it will, will happen and let's make it happen of course yeah let's okay. make it happen <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> my pleasure